But we're going to be reading from 1 Chronicles 29, a, a probably not commonly read book, but praise God, it's full of truth. Uh, and we are continuing our story about David, and we are coming in for a landing. I, th- I thought it was going to be actually only two more Sundays, but I only preached half of my sermon last week. And so I was able to right, fill this one out a little bit, a little bit more. And, and we're going to pick up from David and his plan, his goal, his desire to provide for the temple of God. Because previous to this moment throughout all of Israel's history, since they had built the Ark of the Covenant and built a tent, right? That it's been living in, moving in a tent, a portable structure. And David's had this desire, this longing that there would be a temple, a permanent structure built for the glory of the Lord to the invitation of all the nations of the world that they would all know who God is and how God loves them, right? And so that's what David's had this desire. And I don't know about you, but sometimes even when you have a good godly desire, sometimes God tells you no. And that's kind of a weird place to be in. And that's what happened to David where the prophet, right, and even God spoke to him, and he's like, actually, David, you're not going to be the one to build this temple. It's going to be your son, your son Solomon. But David was like, well, I think, I don't think this is a loophole. I don't think he was trying to trick God. He's like, okay, so I don't get to build it, but maybe I can participate in another way. Maybe I can set up this next generation for success. Maybe I can gather all of the materials and get all of the expert craftsmen and and make sure that my son is going to be a a wise and good king, right? That I train him up to know the God who loves him, to walk wisely before his creator. He's like, I'm going to do everything I can to set him up to succeed, right? Just like you might participate in in giving towards a, a missionary around the world where you never get to go, you never step foot on the ground, on the soil of the nation, of the people that you might be praying for and have a heart for, but you get to participate nonetheless by praying and sending resources to that community, to that missionary, right? To see God bring light and and hope and freedom to those people. (laughs) And so that's what David's planning on doing. And that's what we're going to continue reading about today. First, uh, well, actually, oh, before I get there, let's finish 1 Chronicles 22. Just reread the last couple of verses, starting in verse 18. And so this is David speaking to his son. And right, you can hear the voice of just like a desperate father a little bit, like, son, you got to do this. You got to be wise. Just dig into God. You can do this, right? It is so worth it. I've made foolish choices in my life, Solomon, and I don't want you to do the same. I want you to chase after God with your whole heart. Right? This is what he's saying. He says, The Lord your God is with you, he declared. He has given you peace with the surrounding nations. He has handed them over to me, and they are now subject to the Lord and his people. And so verse 19, Now seek the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Build the sanctuary of the Lord so that you can bring the ark of the Lord's covenant and the holy vessels of God into the temple built to honor the Lord's name. And so not only is it about just building this structure, this edifice, this building that would be glorious, but paired with that is going to be the important thing that Solomon in his own heart and soul is seeking God, right? And this is, this is a conflict because even Jesus in his day recognized there were many times in which we as people, religious people, where we can put on a really good face a really good facade, but we, our hearts are far from him, right? That happens all the time, right? And so like Jesus is after our heart. Jesus wants to be with us. He is currently, right, after having come and died and raised from the dead in order to rescue and redeem and invite us into his household, he is now still at work. He is preparing a place for us that where he is, we may be also, Right? So he has just been all about the business of not preparing a temple like David, but of preparing a place for us to dwell in his presence at all times for all of eternity. That he wants to be with you, which is actually like so absurd because right, he knows everything about us. He knows all of our flaws. He knows our heart. He knows Solomon's heart. He knows David's heart. 
And he knows all of the secret sins that he's had, and he's brought them to the surface to a, a level of repentance that's allowed him to be like, all right, David, now you can get closer, you can get closer, draw in, right? Solomon, seek me with your heart and soul and mind and strength, right? Chase after me with all that you are, right? That God desires to be with his people. And so David is preparing this, and we're going to skip all the way to 1 Chronicles 29, in which he kind of... Uh, not just to Solomon, but now he's got the entire assembly of the people of Israel, and he's going to once again hand over this responsibility of preparing for the building of the temple. So verse 1, Then King David turned to the entire assembly and said, My son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. And, and, like, I, I think that's probably a little embarrassing for Solomon. Like, I know, like, the cliche is pastors always talking about, like, their kids and how embarrassing that is, right? Kids who are pastors, kids that are grown up now, they're like, oh, my goodness, that was the worst when my dad would do that, right? And now here's David in front of all of Israel being like, hey, check out my inexperienced son, right? That's like, dad, what the heck? Come on, man, <laughs> But it was true, and it was in a humbling and honest way, and he wasn't doing it to embarrass Solomon. And Solomon, just so you're aware, became wiser than all of us ever. So he started in experience, but he grew in wisdom with the Lord, okay? And so, so that's a good thing. It's okay to start off young and inexperienced, because that's actually how all of us start off. And so he says, this is my, my son Solomon, who is still young and inexperienced, and the work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals, it is for the Lord God himself. Let's see, let's see, am I in the right? Uh, here we go, I'm skipping over to this one. I realize this was the older version. I was missing a verse. Here we go. It is for the, the Lord God himself. I had two versions of the same sermon. This is the fresher one. Here we go. Okay, uh, and so this, is, this reminds me, of, of the fact that this work that's about to be done is, is dedicated for the Lord, right? And, and we might think like, okay, like I suppose building the temple for God, building the temple on the temple mount in Israel, you'd be like, okay, that counts as work for the Lord. But so often we might not consider the other things that we do to be in that same category. But I want to suggest that God himself receives the things we do as unto himself personally. All right, both actually in a negative sense and in a positive sense. In the case of, of Paul, before he became an apostle and a follower of Jesus Christ, he was out persecuting, hunting, murdering, arresting Christians in the early church. And after doing that, Jesus shows up in his life and says, his name was Saul at the time, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right, this is what Jesus says to him, Saul, in his mind, he's like, who are you? Right? Like, I wasn't persecuting you. I was hunting down all these Christians. But Jesus, he's like, no, you, you understand. When you treat my bride, my church this way, this is how you're treating me. This is personal. Or let's put it in a more positive light. In Matthew 25, 40, at the end of the age, when Jesus summons us before his throne, he says this, that the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. And he's talking about what? About giving food, water, right? Clothing, visiting those who are sick, visiting those who are in prison. And he says, when you did those things, you thought you were just helping someone out, right? Not only are they made in the image of God, but even more than that, like you were doing that as unto me. The king of all creation received that kindness, that good work personally. And so that's the same thing like what Solomon's doing. He's going to build this temple and it's for the Lord God himself. But I want to suggest even more humble works, right? Even things that are not as uh, enormous or glorious, we might think, are still received personally by God and he appreciates and, and blesses back many times over. So verse 2, back Back to 1 Chronicles 29. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. 
And now there is enough gold and silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great quantities of onyx, other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. Right? And so David's been gathering the resources, as we read last week. He says, verse 3, And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I'm giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is in addition to the building materials I've already collected for his holy temple. He says, I'm donating more than 112 tons of gold from Ophir and 262 tons of refined silver to be used for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings and for the other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Now then, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today. All right, and so this is a little bit unusual for us because in a moment we will look at passages where Jesus is like, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, right? Like, like don't sound the trumpet before you when you give. And here's David telling everybody, not only here's my inexperienced son, but also I'm now going to give everything I have to the building of this temple, all of my own personal resources, and, and then here's the quantities, right? And so like, that's a little bit unusual to us, but we can see what his motive is partly. And maybe his heart, let's, let's assume, what if it was wrong? What if it was for his own glory, his own name, his own praise? Well, God's going to know that, and he invites God to judge his motive in his heart in, in a moment. But it seems as though, it seems as though David is doing this purely to be like, who's with me? Who's going to do this with me? Who will follow my example and go with me to, to build this temple of the Lord? Who's going to give towards the kingdom of God? He's doing this to, to lead by example. As the king of Israel, he's like, I'm not going to shy away from the work and, and make all of you do it. I will also be generous in my labors. And this reminds me of the apostle Paul when he's writing to the church in Corinth. And he doesn't actually use himself as an example in that moment about generosity to, to lead others to generosity. He uses the Macedonian church, who is an incredibly impoverished church. He says this in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And here I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You might notice I'm bouncing back and forth between ESV and the New Living Translation. Sometimes when reading the Old Testament, the, the New Living is just a little bit more readable and understandable. And I don't have to take as much time to slow down and explain it all. And so that's, that's why I do that. That's why I do that. So, uh, verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, right, which you wouldn't think you would mix those two things together to have great results necessarily, have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor and taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. And so what's interesting about the Macedonian church that, that Paul is, is bragging on, in a sense, he's saying, like, listen, these are a, a poor, afflicted, right, suffering church, extreme poverty, and yet God has stirred up in their hearts this abundance of joy towards generosity, right, towards generosity, that they gave of their own accord that wasn't arm-twisting, and right, praise God, there are, right, preachers that maybe you've seen on TV or on the radio, or churches, right, where there's arm twisting, and that is not godly behavior, right? That is not the way that, uh, that giving should be done. And we'll even read that verse in a moment. Uh, but notice this. This is the key. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Before they gave any of their, their money, any of their time, any of their resources, they first gave themselves to the Lord. And I, and I want to suggest this is the same thing that David does. Right? He is a man after God's own heart. Back when he was just a poor shepherd boy in the field, and maybe the only thing he could offer to God was the songs he would sing. Right? That's what he gave to God. 
that he had a heart for the Lord first. He gave of his life to the Lord first. He gave of his life for the kingdom of God, for the people of God, where he was even willing to give his life in fighting a giant that every other soldier in Israel was afraid of. He's like, hey, like, I'm going to do this for the Lord. The battle's the Lord's, right? And, and he's, he's willing to do it. And so first thing, before you can be generous with anything else that's going to be received by the kingdom of God, we need to be willing to give ourselves of the Lord. And I want to suggest that that's a much more costly thing because we can't just like buy God off, right? We can't just be like, all right, like here's a tip, God, now leave me alone the rest of my time, the rest of my money, the rest of my resources, the rest of my, my goals and dreams, they're all mine. And, and you just, you stay in your corner away from the rest of my business. Like that doesn't work. That doesn't work, right? Instead, we must give first ourselves, all of us to the Lord. And so in that sense, as a pastor, I'm asking much more of the people of God than, than a shady pastor might be asking, right? He's just trying to ask of your finances, right? Because God might not even lead you to necessarily give to this ministry in different ways, right? God might be leading you to go and do else, elsewhere, right? And that's fine. But the more important thing is that you give your life entirely to the Lord. And I want to suggest you will not regret it. So let's see, verse 6, back to David. Uh, Then, after David invites people to, like, follow his lead, it says that the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals and captains for the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave, keyword, willingly. So once again, no arm twisting. It says, for the construction of the temple of of God, they gave about 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. They also contributed numerous precious stones which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord under the care of Jehiel, a descendant of Gershon. And so notice, not only is David sacrificial in his giving, but now he's leading Israel in the same way. Just as a king, after God's own heart, he's been leading them even in worship, right? Like where he's the one that would be dancing mightily before the Lord as the Ark of the Covenant would come in to Israel, into Jerusalem rather, right? He's like, he's writing songs. He's leading his people into worship. He's also leading his people through giving and generosity. And they're all participating in this. And they're not, they're not upset about it either. It says, verse 9, the people rejoiced over the offerings for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the lord and king david was filled with joy and so the people are rejoicing david's full of joy right and and part of it is because it was freely done and wholeheartedly before the lord right like no one can tell another person like this is what you need to give can't say that but right god and his holy spirit is the one that's going to lead and guide in that way And so this is what Paul says similarly in 2 Corinthians 9 to that church in Corinth. He says this, the point is, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Like that's what God's excited about. That's what God was excited about when Israel and David were sending funds for the building of the temple. That's what God was excited about when the Macedonians were generous in meeting the needs of the the suffering church elsewhere, right? That's what God's excited about. I want to suggest God's not like, oh, sweet, some more gold and silver and stone and like gems and rubies, whatever. Like that's not what God's pumped about, okay? Like God created all of the earth, right, with his voice. Right in the book of Job, it talks about God knows where there are diamonds in the dirt that will never see daylight, that no one knows that they're there. So it's not like God's like, oh, phew, I really didn't know how I was going to make ends meet this month. Thanks, guys. Right? Like God's not pumped about that. He's not excited about that thing. Right? It's, it's not the money that God cares about. It's the people that he cares about and the thing that gives him joy as a God who gives generously and sacrificially 
is that when he sees the heart of his people, right, when he sees someone who cheerfully, joyfully rejoices and being like their dad, like their heavenly father, right, like God could care less about the other stuff. He cares about our heart, right? And so, like, that's what God rejoices in. And it seems as though the people of God are starting to, like, get that as well, where they're rejoicing, they're excited, the king is filled with joy, right? Like, he just experienced the greatest financial loss of his whole life. He just probably, quote-unquote, lost more money than any other Israelite ever had to that day, and he's pumped, right? He's pumped about it, right? Like, he's excited. And and that's what God is excited about, is, is when we give cheerfully because we are becoming more like him. We're taking on the characteristics, the attributes, the nature of our father. And that's a good thing. So verse 10, what does David do now? Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, right? And so it's not like he's like, well, all right, God, we gave money to you today, but we're we're not going to sing, right? Like, no, no, David's like, let's sing today too. We're going to do it. And so he says, O Lord, the God of our ancestor, uh, the, our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. And he says, everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. And so one of the things he realizes is like, we can't even brag when we do give God a sacrificial gift because it was all God's to begin with, right? Even if we tried to spend our entire, let's say 100 years, 120 years hoarding and holding onto it, like as time moves on, it's going to slip through our fingers and we have no idea who it's going to go to, right? Like there's, there's, there's no way that we as humans in this life on this earth can actually like hold on to and keep something and it's like it's all God's anyway everything that they gave that day they recognized actually God this was yours the whole time and and you weren't after all of our resources because you still are providing for our needs you're providing for our food you're providing for our houses and our cattle our donkeys all of these other things right like God owns all of it and by giving a small portion it's an example of their heart being given over to God And he is so happy and thrilled to just bless them back. And so this is one of the the key things, I think, when it comes to this, is just realizing, like, it's not mine anyway. And so Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 9, that God is the one, he is the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, right? And he will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That God's the one that provides for your needs, and he's also the one that provides and gives you the resources to be generous. Right? Like, one of the things, like, I know, like, people, we hardly ever carry cash around anymore, but I know some believers get in the habit of, like, always having something set aside, whether you do an envelope system, whatever it might be, of, like, I want to be able to give generously and, like, believe that God's going to bring someone by in my life this week, right? Whatever that I'm now ready to, like, I've got that seed set aside, ready to give, right? And, like, and then you're just, like, praying and think about, thinking about it and, like, who's God going to bring across my path this week that I can give towards? Because God has not just provided for all of my needs, just for my bread, but he's also provided seed, and so I need to be looking for opportunities to sow into good ground, right, to demonstrate the love and the light of God's kingdom in this world. And then also to express the fact that this blessing that God's given me, the provision that God's given me, does not rule over me, right? Because we as humans, we are so susceptible to corruption and and greed. And just like Jesus would teach us to fast from something that's a good thing, right? By being able to be generous at times, it's like teaching and training our heart or our flesh. No, you're not in charge here, flesh. Right? I'm still going to be generous when I don't necessarily feel like it or when, I, you know, when I'd rather be selfish. Like, you're not going to rule over me, flesh. I'm going, to, I'm going to let the Spirit of God live and dwell and work through me. And I'm going to give freely, joyfully, because that's so counterintuitive to how our own fleshly, sinful nature would want to react. 
right? And so, like, you, you got that seed ready to give. And God provides both, and God's the one who owns all of it, and he gives us our bread. He still provides for our needs while he gives us seeds. It says, verse 12, Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. And so David, as king over all of Israel, this nation that God's given might to and delivered from oppression, right, delivered and and provided for and blessed in all of these ways, David's like, listen, like, God, you're the one who gave us any of that. The only reason I'm wealthy or honored or powerful or mighty is because you've given that to us. And one of the things I'd suggest, because Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And like, not every believer becomes a king of a powerful nation, right? Some of us live humble lives. It's not as though God will not still grant us honor in due season, right? Like that, that even the way Paul talks about the body of believers, that those who have giftings that seem less honorable, God bestows greater honor to. Or if we live a life humbly, generous, right? Living before the Lord, right? Living in godly contentment, which when you do that, you have great gain, right? One day he will honor and lift you up, and it's perhaps in eternity, and God does that, right? Like if the parable of the talents, where he he gives cities and more responsibilities towards those who were faithful, even if what they had been given responsibility over in this life seemed less significant, but if they were responsible with the things that God gave them, He honors them greatly when they step into eternity. David keeps singing and praying. He says, Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you. And we only give you what you first gave us. And so he highlights that once again, like reminding himself, Like, I didn't lose out today. I'm giving back to God what was already his. And then next in verse 15, not only is he realizing it was all God's anyway, he says, we are here for only a moment. Right? He's realizing about the brevity of his life. He says, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us, our days on the earth are like a passing shadow gone so soon without a trace. And so David's realizing, he's like, even if I used all of this wealth to just build my own kingdom, build my own life, only care about my own retirement or those people who were close to me, it's like, my life is only for a moment. Like, what good is it if I use all of my resources and leverage towards making my name famous or giving into my selfishness, right? The way Jesus would say it is, right, what good is it a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? David's getting that chord, he's striking that note where he's realizing, like, we're only here for a moment. It would be useless that if I just held on to all of these resources and riches for my own fame and my own name. My life is so short, and why not use my life, use my resources, leverage them for the kingdom of God and have an eternal impact rather than one in which my name will just fade out amongst the halls of history. He's like, we're only here for a moment. Verse 16, he says, O Lord our God, even this material we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name comes from you. It all belongs to you. And I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. Right? So, like we were saying, God gets excited. God loves, as Paul says, a cheerful giver. And so whether David was doing this for false motives, for his own fame, maybe, I don't know, right? God knows. God knows his motives. God knows his heart. But the thing that God gets excited about is when he looks in our hearts and that the work of the Holy Spirit and sanctification is, is not just, right? It's not just that we are forgiven of our sin, but we begin to be people who become more and more like God. And God delights and rejoices that it's not like he's, he's happy to forgive us our sin, Right? But he rejoices when we begin to act more and more like him. When it's not just about forgiving our debt, but we're actually bringing a benefit to the world, to the kingdom, 
that he's called us to. And so David says, you rejoice when you examine our hearts and you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives, and I have watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. Right? And so David is excited about this. He knows God sees their hearts, that their heart is actually the greater gift that they could give to God than any other thing, right? than any of the resources. It's their heart that actually matters. And this is what God gets excited about. But I will mention from Matthew 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, just to, to contrast, right? We don't need to necessarily go around telling everyone how much gold we gave to the temple, right? That's not what we need to do. But this is what Jesus says, because there is a danger here where people do things out of false humility or do this out of boasting or, or trying to look righteous in the eyes of other people. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, right? And so the emphasis, the heart motive is like, it's like if you, if you gave a tip and then the person didn't see you put the tip in the bucket and you're like, well, I was only actually doing, I wanted you to see me do it so then you'd like be proud of me or whatever, right? The same thing, right? Don't just give so you can be seen by others. Don't just do good when other people are looking. He says, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. So this is all about motive is what Jesus is talking about. Are you doing it to be seen? Are you doing it to be praised? He says, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Like that's it. The right ledger is even. Right? The books are clean as far as you got your little bit of respect from everybody and that's all there is. But if you give in secret, God knows and he's going to come after you. Those blessings will overtake you. Okay, So uh, let's keep reading. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what the right is doing. So that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Right? And so even if we never get credit for what we do, right? David in this moment, it happened to be documented in the Bible, preserved by the Father. Thousands of years later, we're still reading about how much money David gave. Right? Maybe that was his whole reward for that. But he also has other rewards from the Father. Right? Those little songs he sang as a shepherd in the field right? that God saw and God noticed even when no one else even knew the singing voice of David to delight in. All right, but the point is this, right? We give to God because we love God. We give and love others because God first loved us, right? And, and even if no one ever sees or celebrates or measures the amount that we did, Jesus does. He rewards us and he receives it personally, as we'd read earlier. Verse 18, back to David. O Lord, the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. See to it that their love for you never changes. Now, this is like a really weird prayer, and we don't have time. It would actually take days to delve into the theology of whether or not God can override a human's heart, right? So my Calvinist friends, right, I love you, right? You would be like, yeah, God can do whatever he wants with a human heart, right? God can make them want to seek him or not want to seek him. But what's interesting here is, is David's praying this prayer. He's like, God, please, right, make these people want to continue to obey you. The ESV version says, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. This reminds me of, of like praying the prayer like, God, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Right? Like where it's like we, we made the choice, we took the step, like God, we're, we love you, we're giving our lives to you, we're giving our, our resources to you in this case. And Lord, help me to keep doing that. Right? Like where you're, you're signing a blank check of like, God, I know in my future I'm not always going to feel like it. I'm going to get selfish, I'm going to wake up grumpy some days, right? Whatever it's going to be. But God, help me, right? Help me to love you each day. I'm, I'm deciding now, but I'm giving you all my future days too. Please help me to keep loving and chasing and seeking after you, right? Lord, I give you my heart sort of thing, right? And help me to keep giving you my heart is the kind of prayer that I'm reading. 
Verse 19, he says, Give my son Solomon the wholehearted desire to obey all your commands, laws, and decrees, and to do everything necessary to build this temple for which I have made these preparations. And now he's praying this over his kid. God, please, please place in my child a desire to wholeheartedly follow and obey you. Right? Like this is something that's in the scriptures. God doesn't correct it. It seems like something we're, we're allowed to pray for our kids. But at the same time in the scriptures, I do see moments in which God is pleading and desiring for his people to come to him as though their hearts are partly in their control and responsibility. Where he's sending prophets after them or Jesus after them to plead, right? Repent or you will likewise perish, right? He's like, I want you to come to me, right? I want you to love me. I'm crying out for you to to come into this kingdom, Right? Or Jesus and John the Baptist, both, their main sermon headline was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so it seems as though, right, we are partly responsible for the choices we make. But also it's interesting that that a father could pray, that a king could pray, like God, keep their hearts after you. So it seems like that's a fair prayer as a parent. I, I don't know how God answers that prayer, But I know, right, that's how we can pray. Lord, I give you my life. I give you my heart. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And I know today I'll probably want to take those things back and live for me. But help me to to not do that. All right? Let's keep reading. Joe, let's go to verse 20 still in 1 Chronicles 29. And then David said to the whole assembly, Give praise to the Lord your God. And the entire assembly praised the Lord the God of their ancestors, and they bowed low and knelt before the Lord and the King. And so all of these people, after after having this assembly about the the future temple to be built and the resources that have been prepared and their own generous giving and their own singing a song of praise to God alongside their King, they praise God together. They worship God together. It's not just about, right, God, stay off my back, here's some money. Right? It's like, God, I'm going to keep singing songs to you because I love you, I delight in you. And that these are a people who are, are generous. Right? And David, he led the way with that, with that phrase, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? Right? It's, it's one thing right? if we were like, okay, I guess we should probably be kind of generous like David. Could be the takeaway from this sermon. But it's actually far, far worse. It's far, far more costly because we don't just look to David as our example. We, we look to Christ. And he was far more sacrificial in his giving than David was. And we're called to follow Jesus and be generous and to be sacrificial and to obey in the same kind of way. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so we don't just have the example of King David. We've got the example of Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of all the universe, who is willing to lay down his life to show his love towards us when we were his enemies. And he says, oh yeah, you do the same thing. Not that you're the creator, not that you're the King of kings, But in the way that you can, you follow me and you're willing to take up your cross as well and experience perhaps even unjust suffering to show the love of God, the generosity of God towards a people who don't deserve it because you didn't deserve it when I did it for you. And I love you anyway. And I'm now stirring up in your heart a love for me because I first loved you. Paul summarizes it this way in 2 Corinthians 8, our last verse. Verse 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That Jesus surrendered the throne, all of heaven, all of comfort, all of peace, all of the angels rejoicing. He stepped down into this world, this broken, fallen planet that he made full of wicked and sinful people with hearts that are always in rebellion towards God, and we murder him. And he chose to do that from the beginning, knowing that that would be the end result, and he did that. He became poor. He gave up his riches in order to show his love for us. 
that he could lift us up out of selfishness and sin. He could lift us up out of poverty, that he could lift us up out of rebellion, that he could give us clean hearts, new hearts, removing a heart of stone, that we would chase after him, we would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that he would forgive sinners like us, and he would desire us that we would follow him and do the same kind of sacrificial love towards those around us, offering forgiveness towards people who have sinned against us who don't deserve it. Jesus calls us to do far, far more. And just like David said, who will follow my example and give offerings to the Lord today? Jesus essentially says the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your love for us. You are our Redeemer. You somehow have lifted the burden of all of our sins. You've forgiven us when we were not deserving of it. You loved us when we were your enemies, Father. And Lord, you've invited us, you've adopted us into your household, into your family. And regardless of what level of, of blessing we experience in this life, we know that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That, Lord, regardless of what we experience, whether injustice or, or difficulty or suffering, or as the Macedonian church did, even affliction, that, God, we can be a people who joyously give because it was for the joy that was set before you that you endured the cross. And, Lord, you call us, your people, to, to follow after you, not as though our good works are earning salvation because they never could have but because you've forgiven us, you are sanctifying us, and you are working in us, giving us a nature and a character and attributes just like our Heavenly Father, to be loving and generous and joyful in sacrificial giving and displaying the love of God and the building up of the kingdom of God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.